peeps. Like we said, today we're talking about a robot mm -hmm. that can drive better than your average American. Well, this is a special episode, right? Because finally, after three years, we're doing an episode that's coming out of our alma mater, George Mason University. Yeah, we're, we're pr proud patriots over here. Yeah. And uh, let's just say for Bode and I, when we sent, sent this article to each other with text message, we are like, we absolutely <laughs> have to do it because it's for Mason. But also... Absolutely have to do it because it's interesting. It's very cool. And th that's that's the compromise we promised you guys we'd never make. Is We're not going to compromise on telling you what's interesting and impactful. And we're happy that we finally found something that we think is super interesting, super impactful. And also just so happens to be coming out of the college where we met. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, let me say, before we jump into today's topic, though, I want to do a quick plug for our sponsor, yes. Sponsor Electronics. Um, and... As I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the episode, what we're talking about today is trying to develop robotics that can drive um, better than humans and drive well with humans in the loop, drive well without humans in the loop. But an important part of understanding how and why robots are going to get to this point where we can truly trust them to drive um, is understanding kind of the relationship they have with their environment around them. And that's a key point in the article we're talking about today, but it's also... Um, something that Mauser has done a great job as being at the forefront of the electronics industry as a supplier and as a distributor. They, they understand what's going on in the tech, role, tech realm, and they write awesome technical resources about it. The Absolutely. one that we've included today is directly related to today's topic, and they're talking about how the landscape needs to look in terms of roads if we're going to get autonomous vehicles to become feasible on the roads. And they, they talk a lot about kind of the push and pull between doing things that make the roads safer for autonomous vehicles, but make them, make them a little more unsafe for the human drivers that are still on the road and kind of trying to understand how regulators might toe the line between the two to make sure that the roads are safe for people using autonomous vehicles and the roads are safe for people not using autonomous vehicles. And I, I imagine that a lot of our regulators will kind of follow this path that the author from Mazur kind of toes Later. along, which is like yeah. understanding the, the pushes and pulls or the checks and balances in this you know, weird realm where we try to take technology from the lab out into reality. Yeah, I, you know, most autonomous vehicle autonomous vehicles depend on so many spatial cues to um, determine their next actions. So it makes sense that, like, you know, a human can probably tell the difference between uh, this sign being a little bit messed up and what it actually means, whereas an autonomous vehicle probably can't. But I think where the implications get interesting is where you start uh, making decisions that have a negative impact on the human drivers. And that's a perfect segue, by the way, for today's topic, because we're talking about how robots can become more adaptable and more like human drivers so that they can make those human-like decisions. And I think that's something that'll probably help make autonomous driving, be, you know, become a more... I think, like a real thing. A more near reality, yeah. I'd say, as opposed to a distant reality. So let, let's jump into that. Absolutely. Um, um, go ahead. I was gonna say, again, we, we, we've shouted out George Mason University. Um, I, I really want to point out the professor's name. I feel like we often do, yeah. but sometimes we miss it. So this is uh, from uh, Professor Su Xiao. I hope I didn't mess that up. But he commonly goes by Professor XX, which is super cool. It's super cool. Professor Dr. X, Professor X, yeah. X-Men. And the people that work in his lab are referred to as the X-Men. And the lab is called the Robotics, like with two X's. Two X's at the end? Yes, Robotics Lab. Super cool. Just wanted to point that out before we jump into the episode. Yeah, I mean, cool. we we constantly do a running poll here on the podcast of how well... <laughs> Something is named. Yeah, or things like are named or the acronyms are. Let's, let's just go ahead and... Eight and a half. For, yeah, I'm going to say an 8.9. Okay. You for, start to want it, man, I respect that. For this incredible Robotics X Lab. <laughs> Love it. Um... But again, just kind of go back to the context here, right? Um, we want to get to a world where we can trust robots to drive. Um, people aren't great at driving, but right now, in especially specific situations where the terrain is changing, um, humans are a little bit better at adapting to changes in terrain than robots are. So identifying this as a gap where robots aren't proficient yet and understanding what humans are good at as a part of this aspect of driving and trying to teach that to robots is kind of the the, the nexus of their the research here. They're trying to take what humans are good at in driving, teach robots how to do that, and see if they can do it just as good, if not better, than humans. Well, I think it's also worth talking about why that's the case, at, at least for most robotic applications. So um, in this autonomous vehicle robotic uh, segment, 
you have classical path planning, which means, hey, robot, I want you to go from point one to point two, and it just finds the shortest path mm -hmm. there, and it goes, right? Whereas if you propose the same thing to a human being that's driving a car, and then, you know, from point one to point two, there's patches that have a little bit of gravel, a little bit of ice, they won't just cruise at the same speed for the entirety of it. They'll adjust how they're driving to accommodate, you know, uh, the scenario that they're currently in and make sure that they get there efficiently, but also safely. Yeah. Most robots just don't have that yet. They just have that one, you know, path planning A to Z. How can I get this, get there the fastest? Mm -hmm. And and obviously what, what does that result in, right? If you've got a robot that's driving and doesn't know how to change the driving style when the ground changes from smooth to rocky or smooth to slippery, um, instability. Yeah. It, is, it results in instability. It can mean the vehicle, spins it could be mean the vehicle rocks around a lot it could mean something as bad as a vehicle crashes and flips over yeah so when you're trying to get to a realm where we can trust robots to drive just as well as we can and to drive better than we can which is i think is the hope for autonomous driving um this is a huge hurdle that we need to be able to cross yeah and i think one of the difficult things there is um there are definitely laws and calculations you can embed that um tell someone how to do this the right way but the article makes a point of saying that a lot of this, the way that drivers learn is by feel. Like yeah. over time, you just kind of, or at least most drivers, you acquire this knowledge of how to drive during challenging scenarios. Not drivers from Maryland. Oh, tell you that much. oh that's that's spicy take right there. Well, I'll, I'll just say, when we were workshopping the title for this episode, um, before we were shooting, we, we eventually landed on um, why this robot is a better driver than the average American. Because... Uh, Americans aren't great drivers. Um, the leading cause of death, uh, non-natural cause -natural, of death for yeah. most Americans is car crashes, mm -hmm. which makes sense, which is why we've got such a bad uh, a bad rap outside the U.S. as one of the worst driving countries in the world. But being inside the U.S., I I've got a certain hatred. I don't know why for, Ma for Maryland drivers. Because we're Virginians. It's, it's a natural way of things, you know? There are bad drivers. They cross state lines. We get upset during our commute. We naturally have to take it out on someone, and it's just Maryland. It's always the people at the Maryland place. Yeah, doing the bad thing. always. I don't know. I, I've got a Reddit comment to back myself up here. Confirmation oh, share wise. It. Share um, it. Apparently, Baltimore has the worst drivers in the U.S. because um, average driver in Baltimore gets in a collision every 4.2 years and is 1.5 times as likely as anyone else in the country to get in a crash. That's crazy. Maryland. Let's clip that. I, I want that to be shared across the internet and uh, get the attention that we need for this podcast. Vindicate ourselves as Virginia drivers. But I did rest there, right? We, we need to get back to the topic. But um, like you're saying, right, most human drivers have the ability to adapt and to understand what changes in terrain look Correct. like and how they feel. Especially, yeah. let's say, like if you're driving a new vehicle for the first time and you go over gravel versus pavement for the first time, you kind of feel the difference there. And mm -hmm. then the next time you go through a similar situation, you're able to adequately appropriately adjust the speed and the style with which you drive to the terrain that you're driving over. Yeah. And, um, you know, th this is, uh, we, we've kind of laid out the problem, but it really becomes an issue where you're driving at the speeds that you would for a car, like, you know, 40, 50, 60 mm -hmm. miles an hour. And one of the reasons that the Professor XX is so interested in this and the, the entire lab is interested in this is because they're fascinated in robotic applications for first responders, right? Where speed is essential. So if you're going to have an autonomous vehicle that can do first responder stuff, it needs to be very fast, agile, and also not tip over, right? Yeah. So now we've teased it enough. Let's get into it. Like, how, how do they go about this problem? What, what kind of things do they do? Um, again, speed is important. So instead of... Um, I don't know, building a robot from the ground up, they were fast with their time, they were efficient with their time by just getting something off the shelf. And the robot that they got off the shelf is actually a pretty fast one, and in terms of dimensions and I think speed, it's about one-eighth of what you would expect for a normal vehicle okay. that's on the road. So it was a good like scale comparison for how this application that they're eventually going to develop would work in the real world on a car. Um, the next step was uh, applying some sort of a model um, that would help the robot make the right decisions. The problem was that there was nothing out there that could give you this kind of feedback of if you're on gravel, adjust by X or Y or Z. If you're on grass, adjust by X or Y or Z. So that's where the team kind of started doing what they were doing. And I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, 
the you've you've teed up the problem well here, right? You've you've got this out of the box robot. You're ready to start teaching it how to drive better, but you don't have a vast data set mm -hmm. to tell you yet what good and bad driving looks like, especially for this robot size with this package and the speed. So what they did is they just instrumented the heck out of this robot, right? They added a bunch of cameras and sensors that they said felt like it enabled the robot to be able to see. Mm -hmm. So there was a visual sensors to, to understand what's going on in the terrain around it. And then also to feel the ground. And that's similar to the way that we don't actually feel the ground when we're driving, but we have some level of feedback through the steering wheel and through the inertia of the way that we're driving exactly. to, to, to feel what the road is doing back to the vehicle, how the road is reacting to the vehicle. That's something that we can perceive as we're part of the vehicle system when we're a driver. So they added a bunch of inertial measurement sensors. Um, I like to think of them like the canals inside your ear that help you understand balance and help the driver understand when we're being tilted one way or the other, or when the G-forces change in angle or speed. Yep. Um, they added a bunch of inertial sensors um, to this robot to try and understand, again, when you're driving on different terrains at different speeds, with different driving styles, with different levels of aggressiveness, what does it look like? And what does it feel like for the robot to be driving over those different terrains? Now that they have the sensors, they're able to go out and try this, right? Go do this in the field, collect a bunch of data, and then use that to train the model, like you were saying, so they can teach the robot how to drive better. I, I was trying to think about how I would explain this inertial uh, measurement sensors to our listeners. And like, chime in if you don't agree, but I think the best example is like when you're slipping on ice and you start to feel your car tilt a little bit and you're, you're slipping mm -hmm. because the inertial measurements are angular velocity and acceleration. So as, as your car's starting to shift, you, you feel like, okay, now I should be like turning this way to like correct for it and maybe pump on the base and brakes a little bit or do whatever. And now I, I can like take that input and turn it into a meaningful output to self-correct again. And especially if you've never done that before um, or you were around a really tight turn for the first mm -hmm. time while you're driving, you definitely feel this like, almost like a pit in your stomach. Yep. You can feel when the inertial, uh, you know, when your angular acceleration changes. Um, and that's exactly what they're trying to teach the robot to perceive as well, which is um, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, especially to, to whatever extent that the terrain impacts that, how do we make sure that you're having a smooth and safe ride um, and you need to be able to feel whether the ride is smooth and safe to, to train the robot to do that. Because it's not enough for you to just know that you are on ice or you're on gravel. You have to have that extra layer of the field feedback to drive correctly on ice or on gravel or whatever. Yeah, for sure. So now that they have this robot and they've equipped it with all these sensors, what's the natural next step? They put it onto the wild and they kept driving it and tipping it over and having it uh, go through all these trials and errors. And they had they, a bunch of Maryland drivers <laughs> get behind the wheel. <laughs> they actually made a listing that said, hey, if you're a driver in Maryland, we would love to have you as a part of our team to drive this robot. Uh, not really. Not but really. They, they made the robots drive around a lot, right? They're trying yeah. to use all these new sensors to collect a bunch of data. They let it, like you said, crash into things. They let them flip over. They want to understand what good driving looks like and what bad driving looks like and collect all the data to be able to classify the two. This provided a deep learning set for the robot to be able to learn from its own mistakes. Right, and it was the first data set of its kind that could be used to, again, teach it how to drive right. So now that you have this collection of inertial measurements and the context of um, where these incidents happen or uh, what those measurements look like as you are going through these different areas, um, they could start embedding that uh, into the path planning algorithm. And that's pretty much exactly what they did. So what did that result in? Did uh, it actually work? They, they made this awesome machine learning model, like we said, taking in the visual cues, yeah. right? being able to identify what type of terrain am I about to cross over? What type of terrain am I on right now? Also the feel of the road, right? How is the inertial measurements of the car? What's the angular velocity? What are the accelerations of the car? What do they feel like? Mm -hmm. And then use that to adapt the driving strategy. So to reduce the speed or to change the route, like you said, um, driving more intuitively based off of the conditions around it and how that might impact the safety of the ride, um, using that to modify the route planning and the, the driving style that the robot might have. And like you said, to, to be better than the, let's say traditional route planning of a robot, which will drive as fast as it can from point A to point B to point C, now being able to modify that to control for safety. Yeah, and the uh, the numbers are pretty impressive. So 
they noticed whether the robot was driving fully autonomously or with some human involvement, a 62% reduction in instability. So, you know, you're cutting these instances of the robot falling over Mm -hmm. or slipping or whatever by more than uh, over over half of them. Yeah. And they only sacrificed an average of 8.6% of speed. So you're not slowing down a whole lot. You're not like, I don't know, crawling from point one to point two. Um, but you're doing it much, much safer. And what's interesting about their platform, this this uh, model that they've come up with, is that, you know, m- like most algorithms, as the unit drives, it will get better because it has more data to learn about. Learn about. But if you think about this on like a larger platform where there's multiple robots driving in different areas and different conditions, they can also start sharing that data with each other and learn and get better over time. And to add to like the cherry on top, um, Professor XX and team think that they can actually use this exact same model and apply it to aerial drones and uh, marine drones as well. So, you know, there's like uh, turbulence in the air, yeah. uh, how to accommodate that well, and then waves and stuff, waves in, the water. And stuff in the water. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's sweet. And one of the things that I, we kind of skipped over it, but I think it's important to mention here um, is... The 62% improvement, uh, I think it's 62, yeah. right? 62% instability reduction applied also when you had humans in the loop. Right. So it's not just in the situation where, you know, robots sucked so much more than robots driving that where we were able to make a 62% improvement. They were also to get a 62% improvement when humans were involved in the route planning and the steering. So, again, this is a an immediate take back that you can say, like, for my brother, who's a firefighter and has to drive a fire engine as fast as he can to get from the fire station to uh, the site of an emergency, could a system like this be applied for the for him driving the fire truck and be able to, again, get an outsized return by only reducing the average speed by 8%, get a 62% reduction in unsafe incidents and stability in the ride? That, that sounds like a win-win um, without compromising too much on speed, and you can also do it with humans in the loop. So I think that makes this more ripe for implementation right away, as opposed to waiting completely until everything's completely autonomous on the road to be able to apply something like this. This this works when humans are a part of the driving scenario as well. I totally agree, and um, we've done this so what. Uh, the, the next step that I would like to see from this team to add to the so what is um, testing it on an actual car or like something that could be used for this first responder uh, solution that they have in mind. And then seeing how that data looks in comparison to what they've been able to accomplish with this, like, what, one-eighth of a model of a robot. Yeah, I agree, right? That, that for me, the logical next step is to work your way up and scale until we get to a position where we're driving real life-size fire trucks around with an algorithm like this and can build a lot of trust in, you know, the way that it works. Yeah, Professor XX, if you're listening, and the rest of the robotics lab, uh, please give us another reason to cover Mason again and uh, come up with the full-scale version. And also, if you are listening, we would love to come visit and Absolutely. film a bunch of cool content yeah. of what you guys are working on. Absolutely. Uh, why don't you give us the uh, the TLDR, the juicy bits of the sauce about today's episode. Yeah, I'll wrap it up here. We think this robot can drive better than the average American. Americans are known as the worst drivers in the world. The leading cause of non-natural death for Americans is car crashes. As an American, I'm proud to say bad driving exists everywhere, not just in the U.S., but robots from George Mason University are here to fix bad driving, no matter where it comes from. Um, But robots aren't quite ready to replace drivers just yet. Mm -hmm. They especially get confused when moving from smooth smooth to rough ground. Think about, like, from pavement to gravel. Um, This causes slowdowns. This causes accidents when robots are driving. But the fix here, scientists from GMU are using cameras and sensors. They're teaching the robot to collect a bunch of data to see and feel the terrain around them and then how to handle that better through their driving. Uh, The cool outcome there, they've made robots that can drive 62% safer while only compromising around 8% of their speed. And they're trying to share these learnings with other robots to make a bunch of robots better drivers, uh, you know, in every application, on the road, in the air, in the sea. And that's why we say these robots can drive better than the average American. Yeah. And that we're right. It can't. We have the data. We can prove it. Uh, Yeah, I think that's pretty much it, folks. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.